we have a collateral contagion crisis that I think is 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 coming um, because nobody really knows what the true collateral is, and it's changing. We're seeing the collateral in the bank and the commercial real estate suddenly starting to change. So I'm not trying to scare people. I don't mean to do that. I mean, I just mean you need to be aware of where the risk is. That's that's what I'm trying to say here. It doesn't mean the market's going to collapse. It's actually good news because those that are managing this know that if it gets out of control, it's a glow, a, a, a monumental global problem. And nobody is interested in that. China doesn't want that. Japan, does, none, nobody, Bank of Internet, they do not want that. So they will do everything in their power to, to uh, including changing the rules and regulations to help bail it out. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. There are only three months left in 2023. How is the year likely to end up for the economy and the markets? And what kind of year should we expect 2024 to be? To find out, we welcome market analyst Gordon Long back to the program. Gordon, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me back. I always enjoy these discussions. Thank you, Gordon. Same here. Uh, I know you are a sailor. Uh, and uh, I hope you've had a, uh, a great summer uh, out there on the ocean. I'm glad to have you back, though, um, inside here, because I have a lot of questions to ask you. Um, you've sent over some charts. I can't wait to go through those uh, with you. Uh, there's some great material in there. Real quick before we do, though, can okay. we just kick this off with a question I like to ask you at the beginning of all these discussions? What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Um, well, there are two separate questions, actually. The, the economy versus the financial markets, uh, they are a different breed than ever before. You, you know, when I first started in this business, they were kind of one and the same. The markets followed the economy. That isn't, that isn't what we have now. If I so to break it up, I don't think I have a worse scenario than I've ever had to paint about the status state of the global economy. And the United States looks the strongest in the terms of the globe, whether I go through Japan, China, uh, EU. So it's a very bad looking and getting worse economic position. From the financial markets, actually, they look pretty darn good right now. And I'm not talking about just the recent run we've had, but the, the liquidity that I'm seeing, the momentum that I'm seeing, uh, what's happening with the earnings, and there's reasons for it. Um, so, you know, the market will come off and the charts technically uh, will scare you because you look at them. There are a lot of them saying, boy, we're, we're at some pretty critical points. But I, you know, I remember, I don't want to go on on this, but I remember uh, two, 1999 and I got out in the fall of, two, of 1999 because the charts looked just as bad at the time. And the market ran on and it went right in through uh, through mm -hmm. March. And uh, boy, I took a lot of flack for people saying, you know, chicken got out early, what, you know, blah, blah, blah. But a year later, all that money had disappeared. And what I had sold in the fall turned out to be a hero. And everybody, you know, it was positive then, but, you know, who cares, right? But it was, it, it, I feel like it's the same thing. This will go on until it won't. And then it'll go ugly fast. And, um, and that'll be, but I don't know when that's going to be. It'll be, there will be a triggering point and I can speculate on that, but who knows what it'll be, but something will take it down. And, and the problem with it too, this time is we have a massive amount of ETFs out there that have never been tested. And that is somebody can go hit a cell, hit a cell switch on their computer. And we can, we can just liquidate trillions of dollars quite literally. And I remember in 2008, when the chief financial officers did that, just and these were professionals, and uh, and and Bernanke had to march up to the hill and ask for money because he was five trillion dollars had just disappeared. So it'll be the same kind of thing. So uh, di completely different beasts. Okay, uh, and just on that point about um, you know how ETFs are changing the game, um, you're saying they haven't really been tested yet, and we've had you know at least since the GFC, uh, you know ETFs have been on a close to 15 year ride now of just sort of marching ever upward, both from capital inflows, but also prices. And we've had a number of people on this channel talk about how um, the Magnificent Seven, right? I mean, the, 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 the small number of very large firms, many of them technology uh, that make up now, you know, a, a, a very large, a very meaningful chunk of the S&P 500 market uh, cap 
uh, but but I think over half of of the Nasdaq. Um, I can't remember exactly how much of every dollar that goes into the 58, market now. Fifty eight percent capitalization, seven stocks. Yeah. Okay. So seven side, fifty eight percent, I guess, of every dollar goes in goes into this, and so that's been driving the market value of those stocks up, which have then been driving the indices up for a very long time. And we've all gotten very used to that. And what I hear you saying is, is, hey, that can work in reverse. We just haven't really experienced that yet at, at any sort of real extremity. But if the, if capital starts coming out of the markets, the, the indices are going to get hit particularly hard because 58% of every dollar coming out is going to come out of those magnificent seven stocks. Is that correct? Precisely. Precisely. Almost every ETF in some way, fashion, no, you know, there's specialty ones, of course, are somehow connected. But the market itself moves on the beta and alpha. So no matter if it's if they start to go down, everything will go down. And right now, the I've never I've never seen the breadth so narrow as it currently is with the Magnificent Seven and NVIDIA and their contribution in it. I can remember the Nifty 50 back in the 70s, and we thought that was narrow breadth. And then I saw the, the dot-com era was the same thing when we had the Cisco's in a small group, but they even they were broader. And so when the generals fail, things are a problem. And, you know, we just saw, for example, Apple, uh, China suddenly announced that they're not going to allow the iPhone to be sold to uh, the government entities within within China. But, I mean, how, but how many trillion dollar, billion dollars did that take out of, cap of, of Apple stock? Now, it's trying to find support in here. But these are the exposures you face out of this. Uh, you know, AI right now is 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 the driving force with the momentum in there. Um, but and I'm not, you know, I'm a big proponent of where AI is going. But having lived through the technology before, they they go in spur, they go in waves. So there's a corrective, finds consolidation, and we're so overextended, it's going to have to find that consolidation. And the trick today, you know, and I hate to say that it's not a buy and hold strategy. You 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 really have to have some degree of timing and balance at a very high level. I'm not saying on a daily, weekly basis, but certainly on a quarterly, half year basis, you have to be adjusting. Okay, so so more active. And management. you need a manager to do that, by the way. Okay, great. And that you, that you know, you're singing wealthy on from wealthy on song sheet there, because you know we we recommend lots of people who watch these videos generally should work with a professional to help them never put together a plan. Today. But to do this active management that you're talking about, never more than today. And I'm I'm not one of them. Okay, I'm a private investor, so I do it myself, and I know what I have to do, and I've been doing this a long time. And if you're not and, and have that experience, you're exposed right now. Because you're, you're playing against some of the most sophisticated uh, artificial tele uh, programming structures and systems that have been put in place um, that you're not going to beat them. You're just not going to beat them unless you can take a longer term, more systemic, structural kind of approach. And, and, and there are some great opportunities. Okay, great. And don't, and don't I, I pay wanna, attention to the media. <laughs> great. Okay, so we're, we're going to talk about the challenges. Please. I do want to get to the opportunities with you before we're done with this discussion, uh, and I do want to get to your charts real quick. But just to kind of pull in a punchline here, you had said um, it's about one of the worst outlooks ever that you've seen in your career for the global economy. Y you then said that the financial markets look pretty good, and and I believe you were saying right now. But then you shared the concerns that you have, you know, both about. Uh, the fundamentals that need to drive these valuations in the long run and the the hyper concentration of market value right now. Um, and you made some comparisons to, you know, when you got out back in the dot-com era, you're not ringing the bell to say, get out of the markets right now yet, are you? Or are no, you? I'm not, no, I'm not okay. saying that. You know, but I, I, I very much caution that the most expensive thing in the market is chasing that last 5%. Mm -hmm. And whether we've got another 5% to go or 10 or 15%, um, personally, I'm leaving it on the table. I don't I don't want it. Yeah. It's too expensive. To, to use an analogy we use a lot in this channel, you you might say that's chasing uh, or pick, trying to pick up nickels in front of a steamroller. It's just not <laughs> worth the risk. That's exactly what it is right now. And, 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 if, you, and if you gamble and you win, congratulations. But that, that's, not, that, that's not the school I, I come from. And I'm, that's being that's being a speculator, maybe even a gambler, worse than a speculator. Mm -hmm. I'm an investor, so I have a I have a different view, and I look at other opportunities that are in the market, much lower risk, um, and over the longer term will give me a better total return. I believe, um, and time will prove. You know that's where we spend our time.
but I'm not okay, spending great. my time trying to guess this the equity markets per se. And I believe the equity markets will actually follow from the credit markets, which are following from the debt market, the bond market, and the currency markets on a global basis. And 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 they're they tie together pretty well. You get the warnings that way. I always say the equity market is the tail on the dog. It's kind of the last to happen. And okay. Busy, well, right now it's busy wagging, but the nose of the dog is smelling big problems. Okay, and that's what I was going to say. Let's let's start with the nose. Um, you've written recently about the importance of the end of what you call a great moderation, and you sent some some charts over. I'll, I'll pull up here in just a second. But can you can you uh, let, let's start there? Can you just explain to folks what you mean when you talk about the great moderation? Yeah, we you know we've come through a period of forty years where we've had low volatility, low interest rate, falling interest rates, uh, general stability um, uh, across the markets. We've never, we never had that. So the, that 40 years, that great moderation, we've conclusive, we believe has ended. We know, we, we're very strong that, that we believe it's ended. And it's ended, it's ended for many reasons, but the, the, the three easiest to understand um, is, and it's not that they've ended these these three I've ended, but I have changed, and it's always about the rate of change. It's the first derivatives, and and the three are globalization, financialization, and mercantilism. And by globalization, we all know what that means, but we have to understand that the globalization brought down costs, labor arbitrage, cheaper place to put it in the supply chains, and so we've been you know reaching the benefits of that in electronics and everything else in terms of costs for years. Well. That is changing now. We're repatriating some of the information, some of the where COVID brought out some of the exposures with the supply chains. And so that cost advantage, and for other reasons, inflation have changed, change. Financialization was about the rate, but the interest rates continuing to come down. And so now interest rates, well, we went hit zero bound, and now are going back up. And the question is how far they'll go back up. So the, the cost associated with interest is, is changing. And then the whole role of mercantilism um, is also changing. And by mercantile, I'm talking about where places like initially Japan and, and China now, that what they do is they get our, get our money for all their goods, but they don't keep our money. They send it back to America and buy our bonds. And why they do that is it drives the bond prices up, but the interest rates down. And therefore, it's cheaper for us to consume. It also means a stronger dollar, which means they can buy more of their goods. So it's a great deal for them. And, and it, it, it just it actually makes us uncompetitive against them. And it drives us into being a consumption economy. And that gig is the three have lasted for 40 years. And now we're a 70 percent consumption economy. We consume more than we produce. And how long does that go on? And now we've got, what, $95 trillion between the, between the government, not 34, the government, our consumers and, and corporate. And uh, and that's a problem. Now the, now the other countries around the world are saying, whoops, is your credit still as good as it used to be? How much of those dollars do I really want to put with you? And uh, well, they'll still, they're still buying generally. Um, I shouldn't even say that China still or, or Japan still buying, um, but they're they're starting to hedge their bets on that. A little long winded, but that that's what I mean by sudden so rate moderation has changed. What it's going to mean? Higher volatility, higher inflation than we've been accustomed to. Forget this two percent goal, not going to happen. Three percent they'll probably adjust it to, and right and even four and a half, and it's higher if you really count it properly. Higher interest rates. And and uh, and high risk premium, both on duration on the bond market and on the risk premiums and equities. We've got beginning to see it in the bond market, haven't seen it in the equities, but that's what's going to happen. And, and just to, not to be long winded here and, and why we have to do that is to keep the economy going. We have we need more GDP. And so to get the GDP, it means more money fiscal, not necessarily money, but fiscal money being pumped in, which means higher inflation. So they have to balance that so that there's a return and we can we can attract uh, money in. And I can get into how they're doing that. Or okay. Planned, at least. Okay. Let, 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 in our let's opinion, do... I'm, these are just my opinion. I'm not giving investment advice here. Yeah. Um, well, let's do get into that. Uh, I have had this chart up while you've been talking here, right? Which which shows 
uh, kind of the the eras that you see that we've been through and the great moderation there from the start of the millennia to uh, COVID, basically, you know, we enjoyed, as you said, low inflation and moderate growth and, and low interest rates. Uh, now you can see that uh, inflation uh, obviously has taken off. Um, the the uh, cost of debt has exploded. Um, volatility, you said we'll, we'll get higher from here. And we certainly saw that as, you know, the markets rolled over last year. Um, so you can already very visually see the difference here. Um, you then have uh, let's see, um, another chart here on the same topic. And let me just see if I can bring it up here, um, which shows that, uh, uh, you know, very clearly we, we've been from this era of contained inflation to now an era where inflation is is obviously much harder to, to curtail. Um, but you said, you know, we, we, we're going to see compression of things like the equity risk premium uh, from this new era that we're in. But... Um, uh, we haven't really seen that reflected much yet, right? We saw it a bit last year. Markets have recovered last year. I assume you you expect to see the S and P have some sort of material correction here uh, to 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 match the, the the fundamental trends of this new era. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. But I, I I when I said the risk premium, you said the risk premiums are going to go up. Okay, just to make that clear on equities. So they're going to be more. They're they're going to have to absorb that uh, uh, risk premium, uh, which will take which weakens the stock price. It's more. To okay. Absorb. Got yes. Sorry. Yes. So, so the, that's, the, that's, the, 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 the ultimate the ultimate result is that stock prices will come down. Is that because risk premium markets are are more risky, both equity markets and the bond market. So the risk premium is in the duration on the bond market, and both of those are going up. It just it. There's more risk than we've been accustomed to over the, during the period of the Great Moderation, and they've started to happen in the bond market, but they have not happened in the in the equity markets at all, at all. Valuations are historic levels. We talked about the breadth being minor. Um, I mean, right now you get better yield on a, on a bond, even the ten year. Remind the the two years paying over five percent. I can't get that on the equity market. So why would you invest in equity? Right. And well, I, think I've seen a stat that the, I think I've seen a stat that the equity risk premium is like the lowest it's been in 20 years right now, to your I, point, which is long, what, why would somebody long, want to go into bonds and into stocks right now? Yeah, exactly. But that doesn't mean they're not going to, because there's so much momentum right now and the fear of missing out. And if you're a if you're a fund manager, you can't you can't lose out on this lift. You you miss it for a quarter. You're out of work. So, you know, but they can take the risk because it's not their money. It's their job. <laughs> OK, whereas if it's your money, do you can you really afford that risk? And that's so is I this is, is this sort of like a like a wily e. coyote moment then that you think, Gordon, where the Perfect coyote's analogy. off the cliff? He just, you know, gravity just hasn't yet to kick in yet, but it is going to. That's exactly exactly the analogy here. But we can stay floating here for, for quite a period of time. All right. Well, in until, one of the until ways there's that... nobody left to buy. The market is really good at knowing when there's nobody left on the sideline and then it just pulls the rug out and there's nobody to buy because it's going down. They're all fully invested. They, they're a matter of fact, then they have to sell to get out because of the pain. So we haven't had a capitulation and I don't mean to be a doom and gloomer here, but we haven't had a, a capitulation in the market. Since 2008, and even it yeah. was minor compared to what I've seen in previous ones. So, um, and so the, the when that capitulation sets in, it gets into this ETF discussion we have. It'll it will be when it happens quite violent. But and here's the here's the big but, and I need to say this right now: don't ever underestimate the government and what it'll do to change the rules to stop it from happening. It's too bad. And in 2008, I can remember when we came off that bottom and it was like, boy, I, there's still more here. Why is it coming off the bottom? And we were all scratching our head thinking, is it time to jump in? But it, it, it didn't say we should. And what it turned out is they changed the rules. They went from all the $84 billion worth of derivatives that were at all the major banks. They said, well, you don't have to mark them to market anymore. Mm -hmm. You can mark them to magic. Or mark them to whatever you want. Forget it. Don't ignore it. Suddenly, it just changed the whole the rules, and boom, the market was off. 
And as soon as it came out, we understood the rules. And, and you need to understand this. We still do not have, we never went back to mark to market. And the derivative market is bigger. So think of the exposure you're sitting there on that one. I uh, We could spend the whole conversation just on that. Um, yes, we could. I, I don't want to rat hole in it, but just to help people understand your comment there, uh, you're basically saying the derivative market is, it was bigger today than it was back then, but the der derivative market is massive compared to the stock and the bond markets, right? Um, and it, it, I've seen it visualized before. Um, it, it is way more massive than I think most people watching this video are imagining when I say that it's it's massive. And so the, the, the risk there is that if you get some sort of cascade of failures in the derivative market, I mean, it, it could be kind of apocalyptic. And I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it's just the size of the derivative market, uh, I'm trying to underscore here, is, is I mean, vast multiples more than the stock market and the bond market combined, correct? Well, if it, even the global economy. Global economy, what are we, 80, $82 trillion? We trade $650 trillion on the global currency and, um, and, and interest rate swaps alone. I think it's 660 trillion. Now you have no visibility of that because it's traded over the counter. It's totally opaque through the Bank of International Settlements. They're the only ones that see it. I'm not saying there's anything nefarious going on here. I'm saying that's the reality. The derivative market is so, so large and so powerful that it's behind the scenes that you don't see that the stock market and the bond market, frankly, are are just kind of like little mirrors of what's really going on. They're not what's going on. They're the product of what's going on. And you, I see it because I follow inflation swaps. I don't follow what the tips are doing. I, I, I look at the trading on inflation swaps. How many people are following inflation swap? Try and get that information. Um, I, I look at what's happening um, right across the right across the whole derivative structure. And 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 for example, um, the quickest way of saying it. The, the, there are things now, I'll back up. In 2008, we, when the market collapsed, we learned about derivatives. We learned about collateralized debt obligations and credit default swaps, for those that remember that. And it was like, what is this new world? And we got in and we explored it. And I'm like, how did I miss that? How How is this going on? I kind of knew about it, but I didn't realize the size of it. Well, that is that was when they were learning about derivatives. Now we're into the point where, and I'm going to ask the audience, do you know what collateral transformations are? Do you know what collateral swaps are? Well, because the collateral is now being rehyped for land, for debt, being rehypothecated. In other words, lent out in so many different channels that are claiming it. You don't even know who really has the real ownership of the underlying collateral. We have a collateral contagion crisis that I think is, is, is coming. Um, because nobody really knows what the true collateral is, and it's changing. We're seeing the collateral in the bank and the commercial real estate suddenly starting to change. So I'm not trying to scare people. I don't mean to do that. I mean, I just mean you need to be aware of where the risk is. That's that's what I'm trying to say here. That doesn't mean the market's going to collapse. It's actually good news because those that are managing this know that if it gets out of control, it's a glo a, a, a monumental global problem. And nobody is interested in that. China doesn't want that. Japan, does, none, nobody, Bank of Internet, they do not want that. So they will do everything in their power to, to uh, including changing the rules and regulations to help bail it out. Okay. Um, this was not That's the main news. focus of the conversation, but it may turn into to it. Um, so yes, the entire system is geared towards not letting the uh, derivatives market get into some sort of cascading collapse um, and they'll do everything they can, including changing the rules and every unnatural act that they may be forced to do. I guess my question to you is expect that, uh, expect, that. expect it. But let, let me ask you this. Um, despite all that, do you think it is still likely that there will be trouble in the derivatives market that does get out of the control of, of the authorities? Well, we saw it. Yes, I, I do. We saw it in Britain here uh, in the in the winter, and it it uh, it almost brought down the country uh, until you know the guild was out of control. It was within in, like a day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It brought down the government, and she was the prime minister for less than like 30, 35 days. And yeah. her and her finance, but it was go. It was that serious. 
And that's when they discovered the derivatives that they were used called liability pledges that they were using, which was another structure, unique way of using derivatives, suddenly got out of bound with bound. And, and what, what a cause it is, everything's based on boundary conditions. And so we're, when you start to get volatility swaying and swaying across multiple markets, currency, bonds all at once, it's in, in multiple countries, it's almost impossible to know which ones are going to get pushed out of boundary conditions. We're seeing it with the yen here recently starting to push that upper end of the yield uh, yield curve control uh, that, that all of a sudden everybody's in a panic mode. And once it starts, so that that's the exposure and it's being closely monitored. It's being closely followed. It's being played very carefully. But the, 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 the there's so many things that can fracture. That's where the risk comes in. And, and, and it shows in why the, the, the premiums are going up, why the bond yields are going up. All right. And, and that's one of the things about the derivative market that that I think of that worries me, which is it is so vast. Uh, you know, I've talked on this channel about really the number a trillion is so large that smart people like you, Gordon, I mean, we still really can't wrap our brain around how big a trillion is. And we're talking here about hundreds of trillions of dollars of derivatives, which are basically sort of side arrangements made between many different types of parties, right? And because of the complexity and this and this huge scale, it's really hard to know that if if one asset class gets in trouble, then the question becomes, well, is that a rehypothecated asset? And if so, then who else thinks they're holding that? And if it if it gets written down over here, does that mean that hedge fund or pension fund over here then starts to blow up and then they have to sell collateral, which then triggers out yet another issue here? Like it's it's so enmeshed and entwined in ways that I don't think a human can have full view of of the entire interconnectedness of it all is that it, it's this super complex system that we just really can't fully control. And so that if there is a failure in here that gets away from folks, we just don't know how it's going to ripple through this. We're just going to have to watch it unfold in real time and kind of be reacting to everything. Exactly right. The complexity now is beyond the, bo the, 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 the peril, if you would. And here's the problem. You can't fix it because you don't even understand what's going on. Right. So you've got to kind of let it finally play out until it stabilizes at some level. And I can assure you that stable that level's too low because it's so opaque. There's nobody that has real visibility. You could have a problem in Argentina in, in a company or a bond, and that cascade, like the First World War in, in the Balkans, could suddenly take over. That's the ex ex exposure that, we, uh, that we're currently in. And you don't know what type of derivative it might be. Okay, and, and I, I apologize, I don't mean to scare the audience. This is just the hard reality of when I use the word risk, what I'm specifically referring to, not whether a stock is overvalued. Okay. Um, all right. Well, look, one of the things you've been writing about recently, which I believe is one of the examples by which uh, the governments and the, the the folks who are trying to hold the system together, right, and keep it running as happily as they can, uh, is stealth liquidity. And I've talked a little bit on this channel about how, um, you know, we had we had a number of people I interviewed a year ago saying, "Oh my gosh, you know, coming into to, to this year." recession looks imminent because you know the monetary stimulus bigots have been turned off and they're not passing any more fiscal stimulus the way that they were back in in 2021 um and that uh you look at the macro data and it's all showing you know flashing recessionary warnings uh, and yet stock market has powered higher this year pretty healthily and the recession hasn't hit and we have a lot of talk about a soft landing or increasing talk about a no landing uh, and you, you know you kind of scratch your head and say, well, gosh, wh why hasn't the bad news materialized? Uh, and, and increasingly, folks have been starting to point to the deficit, which is, hey, well, well, we're we're doing very aggressive deficit spending this year. You know, I've, I've sort of summarized it as we've got a wartime deficit in a peacetime economy here, right? And uh, you have done even more work on that beyond just the headline number of what's being spent in the deficit to show that it's it's. Uh, you know everything from bank deposits, uh, the the bank uh, was it term funding uh, program that that the right. Fed uh, and yeah. Treasury yeah. released. Uh, there's reverse repos involved. There's there's Treasury auctions. So you've kind of you've kind of visualized for this for everybody what's going on. Can you talk a bit more specifically about how the system is 
kind of being propped up right now by this this large amount of stealth liquidity? Um, absolutely. It, it is on the surface complex, but if you have a graphic there that they're kind of uh, nets it out, the, the confusion comes that says, look, we're, we're tightening, as you said, with quantitative tightening. We're tightening on our credit standards. Um, so therefore, we're, we're, we're taking liquidity out of the market at a pretty sound le level. How can we have markets going up? Well, the answer is we have stealth liquidity and it's it's calculated, it's planned, it's and they've taken advantage uh, basically two events, one in March with the deposit run was expected out of banks, banks with uh, paying no no deposit rate at, at all, where they could suddenly capture three, five, five, five percent on a two year bond, even as we talk our note as we talked to uh, today. And and then when the um, when we uh, finally uh, resolved the uh, the the debt ceiling in June, June, they were key. They were key instruments that fell in place to allow this to happen. But it's been happening since January. And over in the left, what it represents that when the money goes out of the bond, out, out take depositors were taking it out. They were taking it out, and they were going to money market of funds. You can see in the top center. So the money was leaving, but but suddenly that created a huge problem at the, at the banks who got to have assets mounting liability. So we came in, as you said, with the BTFP program. So we, so the government pumped money into the banks at the really the same level of which the deposits are going out and the deposits are still going out and we're still putting more money into it. So we're not pumping liquidity into the economy. The bank, the central bank is pumping money into the banks to keep them solvent. But the money left. The money while the deposits went to the money market manager. So what did the money market managers do with it? Well, it went in kind of in the stages in there because they were putting they were putting their money into reverse repos for here for the last two and a half, three years because they were paying such good rates. So we took the reverse repos all the way up to about two point six trillion dollars. And they're making great rates, cheaper. Over, this is quick overnight, one week kind of money, very quick. And that's where they were all good. So as the money started to flow into the, mar the money markets, even more pushing on the reverse repo, the government kind of like, and we were in the middle of a treasury auction at the time, which is over in the level called the, the, the TGA or the treasury auctions, where we couldn't really issue at a debt ceiling limit, but they started buying the short term. Janet Yellen, very, very clever, I'll use the word devious um, uh, individual, was smart enough that she kept it floating by floating all this short-term money. So the money flowed over to the treasuries. Then subsequently, when the when the uh, uh, debt, debt ceiling was increased, now she could go longer out on the curve, more treasuries or, or more 10-year and 30-year. More of that money fled from the money markets out of the our, our reverse repo. So very reverse repos have went from 2.6 trillion down to 1.6 trillion. Our, our uh, 1.6, one trillion dollars has disappeared. Well, it didn't disappear. It went into buying the treasuries. Well, okay, so they went into the treasuries. Well, the treasuries didn't float them through the market like they did. They didn't go out into debt. They went to the and they spent the money. They pushed that money right out, avoiding the banking system, right into the hands of consumers in terms of transfer payments, disability payments, our, our extending uh, student loans, extending uh, moratoriums on foreclosures. Uh, there was there was even tax rebates that they could they bypassed associated with uh, um, uh, crises, weather related crises that were coming through. So the, the the money went straight out into that and into corporations. So for example, I know in New England we got everybody here selling heat pumps stalling solar panels if they can mm -hmm. get the business peak and the well, prices went sky high because you're getting the subsidy which all kind of disappeared but that's all money into all of the small contractors and etc they're trying to hire people they're trying to grow so that whole business so we have a strong economy this is effectively adam what we what we used to call the potential for modern monetary theory mmt this is bidenomics version of mmt um, and that's how they're doing it. And that's how they're pumping up the money. Now it's going to come to an end. Okay, they can't keep doing this for for a number of reasons, and that's that's the really real exposure here on it. But it was it? I think it was an I'll give the devil the do. It was a brilliant strategy, and it and it fed in with this rush into artificial intelligence, 
that was able to happen and it's taken the market with it but it, it's it's a it's it's unsustainable unless the government continues to hand out money directly and that is printing more of it and taking our debt even higher and to do that how is it going to pay the debt where's the where's the funding going to come to to bring the new money in and, and that that's a discussion in itself, which needs our, our listeners need to answer. Where is okay. the money going to come from? Well, let's let, let's have that discussion in just a minute. But right right now, what I heard you say is we sort of have been enjoying maybe that's the wrong term, but but two sugar rushes this year, one economic from the stealth liquidity and then one in the financial markets from all the hype in AI. Right. So. Um, uh, you know, the, the downside of a sugar rush is it's super fun on the way up, uh, but then you you end up, you know, with the withdrawal factor and it's a lot less fun. But, you know, it only matters once the high ends. So to your point about, I hear you saying, look, what, what's happening right now with the stealth liquidity, uh, it's working, but it's not sustainable. My question to you, Gordon, is, is if you had to, if you had to take a guess, when will it have to stop when we'll have to start reducing. And, and I guess the question in most investors' minds right now is, is, can this continue through the election? Presumably part of this is being done so that the administration doesn't have an economic crisis on its hand going into an election year. Can it last that long? Or do you think that it, it's too unsustainable to be able to be pushed out for that long? Two elements to the answer. Um... The, the, the stealth system I just described is unsustainable through to the uh, elections. The real question is, what is their plan to replace it? And when is that plan going to unfold? Yeah. And that plan is is twofold. Uh, well, it's, it's actually at least two that are clearly visible to us right now. Um, uh, one is associated with using um, contingent liabilities to guarantee credit that are issued by the government to places that, well, it, may, it could be Green Deal, it could be climate change, whatever, but organizations that they will guarantee their lending so that they can continue to sustain their, their spending and their growth. So, uh, and they're not, uh, contingent liabilities do not go on the deck of the balance sheet of the government. They only go if somebody defaults on the guarantee. So they're like uh, foreign aid. They just sit there until somebody defaults and then the government has to step up. All right, so, sorry, sorry to interject, but this is almost kind of like an off balance sheet transaction you're saying. Totally like off balance. We're not going to have visibility into this. No visibility. You won't even know what's happening. You will not, you will, it will, there's no paperwork other than the government says that it has these contingent liabilities somewhere down in the small print. You, and they won't give you any details, but uh, they'll do that because that's the way that they can easily bridge this. And it's off, it's, it's off balance sheet until somebody defaults. That'll be part of the problem or part of the answer if they're not already doing it, because it's the only way out that's sustainable over a longer period and really continues this sort of MMT version of Bidenomics. The, the second part of it, and to me, this is the, 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 the most pressing, is the, 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 the most of the countries are now selling off their dollars, not all of them, uh, but China, Russia sold off all its treasuries, U.S. treasuries. China's taken theirs from about 1.3 down to eight or 900 billion. Um, all of the BRIC 11s pretty well are getting out of the dollar. So it, there's a weak, there's not the buyers coming into the dollars. The only one that's out there that has been buying but is flat has been China, has been uh, Japan. And the Japanese carry trade is so profoundly important to the global economy and has been since the 1970s for 40 years that people just miss it, the importance of it. And so it's really trying to ignite the Japanese carry trade. Um, and that requires a stronger yen for them to lending. It requires a larger differential. And these are all falling into place. And we, we, expect, um, we expect that to be a big shorter term uh, push into the market that will come through the um, through the, yeah they, there's a good the trade you just brought up is a kind of a representation because when the when it was going down on the left that was the dollar weakening so the yen was going up and so you could if you were sitting in Japan and you're getting nothing on your interest one percent 
You're not going to lend money. How are you going to make more? But you make it if the yen is going through the roof. So you, you lend the money up because they're going to pay you back in yen. And so you're making your money on the currency. You're not making money in the land. So you lend it 1%. You got somebody sitting over in America and says, oh, my God, I could take 1% in Japan. I can buy treasuries here at 4.5%, pocket 3.5%, and I put it up in leverage. I can leverage it to 20%. What am I missing here? Well, the answer is you hedge the currency. And so the, the and the banks throughout the world, insurance companies, a pension plan, this is nothing new to them. They've been doing it for 40 years. And so they, they need it and they need the business. So there's a big push here. And so now, so the last few years, we've had some problems with quantitative tightening. It hasn't been as good for the for the for the, the Japanese. So the Japanese rate of buying has been flat, and that's been a problem. We need with the rate at which we're creating increasing the debt, like we need, you know, we we need to drive another six trillion dollars up here without putting it on the Fed balance sheet. So we we need we need people like the Japanese carry trade, and there are other carry trades. I'm just focusing on the Japanese because it's so substantial. And by the way, we cannot have them selling their <laughs> selling uh, their uh, their dollars to store up their currency if it had if it keeps falling. So. Um, that, that's another push that they're, they're, I believe, they're highly orchestrating right now. And you can see it in the currency markets, see it in the credit. You, you know, the footprints are pretty large. Okay, so let's let's talk about this um, in a little bit more detail as it relates to what's going to happen to Treasuries going forward. Um, you know, right now Treasuries are yielding uh, a real yield, which they haven't for a long time. Um, Major point. Yep, yeah, and and it's. Um, in many ways, that's very attractive for the average investor, especially if you're a bit older, right? Uh, you know, during the era of QE and ZERP, uh, if you were a senior who had expected to live off the you know the income of your portfolio in your later years, you were getting totally hosed, right? Um, now you can start <laughs> raising your hand. Uh, now you can actually get a pretty good relative return in, in the safety of treasuries right now. Um, so we've had a lot of people, a lot of analysts in this program say, hey, enjoy it while you can, because the economy just can't withstand a cost of debt this high, right? And there were a lot of people, as as Powell was hiking rates, who were saying, look, he'll never get above 3%. The economy just can't stand it. Well, now here we are, you know, at five and a quarter or wherever we are. Um, and uh, that has led to a lot of discussion about, well, uh, if indeed you know, the Fed is going to have to pivot at some point because either it fixes inflation, right, and can declare mission accomplished and start bringing rates down, or as more people think, something will break and the Fed will have to step into rescue and start bringing rates down, uh, that that will cause the long end of the duration curve in U.S. Treasuries to rise. And that, you know, you can sit in the safety of Treasuries and get paid. And then when that that rescue, that pivot happens, you're then going to get capital appreciation on top of all of that. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the probability of this. Uh, I know that you have made money in similar situations historically uh, where rates have come down and, and the long end of the curve has gone up. Are we looking at another really good opportunity in long-term treasuries right now, or is it more complicated than that? Everything's more complicated, but the simple answer is yes. It's going to repeat itself but obviously a little differently. But right now, the uh, I'll use a 10-year. Uh, as we're sitting here, it's trading at 4.34 when I look over here, um, which is a pretty good range. We felt that the market would start to run into uh, a roadblock, at least on the equity, somewhere around 4.2, 4.3. But we still believe it'll trade upwards through maybe 4.5 on this round. Um, and at some point in there, something, it's not just something that's going to break. There'll be weaknesses in the market. Um, and we think that the Fed will then fairly aggressively will pivot. I don't think it's, I don't think it's imminent unless something breaks. I think it could drag itself well out into first or second quarter uh, of next year before it really does pivot. It may be sooner. Uh, but if you're sitting in the bonds, it's just be a pretty good probability that they'll be forced into pivoting. How far and deeply they go will be less than you think. But they'll have to take those those rate those rates down, and there's and there'll be some pretty significant capital gains if you want to go further out in the duration suit of the 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 thirty years. So, 
that's nice. And a lot of people just want to want to lock it in. But I think there'll be a ba- a, a trading range between um, high three, about four percent, maybe four point six, somewhere in there that we'll be in bound range for a period of time. We we traded quite significantly here on a trading range between three point two and three point six five here for about the last year, um, because it, it, the, the the beauty of the bond market, if you're a technical kind of guy. Uh, it, it's pretty nice follows the technicals. It really it's it's, it's pretty nice to see. Um, so the um, that, so that's what we think it'll do. It'll come down um, um, later on. It'll trade in this bandwidth I just described. Then it'll come down, but but it's going back up then, and it'll go back up violently because inflation, uh, Adam, is nowhere even close to being solved. That's the bottom line, and so. What that higher range will be, well, it'll then go back into the four uh, and a half to five percent range. Bill Gross has been doing it, the bond king. He thinks it's 4.5. Most people I know think it's somewhere in there, but I, I think it could go higher. I'm more aggressive in what I think inflation uh, problems will be. So it could go, but that's not imminent. That's not now. There's a corrective in here because the government will be forced to push more money out through the fiscal spigot. And that won't, I won't call it hyperinflation yet, but I will call it a, another big surge. And it'll be it'll be because inflation comes back in a third wave, and 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 very strongly. Pete, I, I said it to you earlier, and I guess in a note that you know I I entered the workforce in in the 70s, so I understood inflation. I was working at IBM, putting in uh, mainframes, our computing systems. And that's all we lived in. It was a tough, tough de- decade. But we forgot the three things that got us out of the 70s. And we're not fixing those. And then, and, and that's why I say I am so confident that we're going to see inflation come back in another big wave. All right. I've got another question, but just because you mentioned it, you said three things that got us out of the 70s. Can you name those three things real quickly? Yeah. Vol- uh, Volcker magic. And by the Volcker magic, I'm not talking about the great story everybody knows that they took interest rates up to 19%. I'm talking about the real way he solved it. Um, and, I, and I think I'd give you a chart on that too, uh, Adam. Uh, but what Volcker did, Volcker was, before he became chairman, was the president of the New York Fed over here on the left. And when he was president of New York, that, the New York Fed is the Federal Reserve, or at least it used to be, not Washington. I was a figurehead. The power was in the chairman of the New York Federal Reserve. And, and he believed then that the only way he, he couldn't manage interest rates, that was, that was dictated through the board as they, as they committed. But he knew that the way to solve it was to get rid of the liquidity, tighten the liquidity spigot. And so he forced the liquidity spigot to be tightened. Um, before he actually, in the summer of, of, of 79, became chairman. And when he went in as chairman, he was forced to increase interest rates because it was, the economy was so was falling so bad that he increased the rates. He drove them up quite significantly, and he drove them into a recession. So then he had to bring them by the summer of, of, of 80. We were in a recession, and he had to bring them down. And, it was, and, and, and he looked like a fool. It was called, you know, they had all sorts of names, but it was a and everybody forgets it, but it was a Folker debacle. But he, but because, but he knew that the real solution was that over was the liquidity you had to, and and the rates. No matter what you did with the rates, it was short term. It would give you a recession. It would be would solve those problems shorter term, but it was not going to solve the inflation. So then, when the second time around, he did what everybody know. He just took the inflation right up, and he says, "Because I know I bought enough time." on that liquidity over the stop, I have really slowed it. This is going to be, and I got to give it a shot. And he did it and he broke it. And if you follow that chart, we have managed that liquidity level all the way through the great moderation. Yes, I know we pump money with quantitative easing and we put it out, but it was in a managed controlled fashion. It wasn't volatile. It wasn't like the Biden administration pumping out $6 trillion, like a shock to the system. Over on the right hand side, that 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 is taking liquidity and the stealth liquidity and is pumping it into the system. That ain't going to fix inflation, and you can't take that away. And we haven't solved the energy problem, et cetera. So the, the Volcker problem I just described, you said I said there was three. The Volcker problem, there was the petrol dollar that uh, that uh, the Secretary um, um, of State put into place. 
And that was agreement with Saudi Arabia. And the petrodollar as of eight months has gone away. And remember, the petrodollar was all about supporting Saudi Arabia and by supporting them with arms and, and et cetera, keeping them in power, the king, they would gold or would, uh, energy would only be bought and sold in dollars, U.S. dollars. And they had to take the money and deposit it in a U.S. bank with in treasuries. From there, mm -hmm. they could do other things with it, but it had to do that, which solved funding problems. It solved the beginnings of infl inflation problems in terms of an uh, the energy costs. We've just ostracized Saudi Arabia so badly that no longer are they transacting in, well, they now have the um, the um, BRIC 11, and three of them now control uh, the three new members, 48% of the world's energy market. So we have this energy problem that got us, we saw that got us out of the 70s, like the Volcker got us out of the 70s, but it was also the second was energy, and we've crumbled it. And then the third was the Japanese carry trade that we brought really into existence then. And it's we've got it's the only one we may be able to uh, reignite. I'm trying to be very simplistic here, but mm -hmm. that, that's what nobody wants. Nobody talks about. But if you'd lived through it, Heather, you li I remember these deals and how important it was to the entire and it allowed us to consume more than we produce for 40 years. All right. And what I hear you saying is, is that uh, we're, we're botching at least two of those. Uh, and are not going to be able to rely on, you know, all three of those factors that led to this great moderation. And we're going to have to figure out how to navigate a new world that doesn't involve all of those. And we don't even yet know to what extent we're, you know, each of them may still exist or not exist in this new era. Um, all right. So if I heard you correctly on just getting back to the um, bond yields for a second, treasury yields, I heard you say, uh, What's going on right now is unsustainable. Um, there are probably is some sort of co correction coming. Um, unclear exactly when, but probably measured in quarters, not years, um, where uh, the Fed will likely have to intervene. Um, yields will come down. Uh, long bond prices will go up. Um, but then uh, because of the dramatic centralized response, both on the on the monetary side from the central banks, but probably also maybe on the fiscal side as well, inflation is going to re-explode, and they're going to have to tighten rates again uh, to to get that under control. Um, and so there's going to be some sort of like down and up progression that you expect. Um, correct me if that's wrong. And also in your answer, uh, when I had Felix Zuloff on this channel at the beginning of the year, he basically said we're now entering the decades of the roller coaster where you're just going to see these, this high volatility. And I think what you just described there is kind of exactly the type of thing that Felix is talking about, where you're going to see kind of very aggressive policy in one direction until the whole system starts to fall apart. And then you're going to see it lurch to the other side on policy. And we're going to just see a lot of this you know, violent swinging back and forth. And that's going to cause roller coasters, both in terms of economic growth, but also obviously in terms of financial asset prices. Um, now I'll let you respond here, but did I did, did I summarize should your general outlook for the next couple year or so uh, accurately? Uh, I would say so, uh, and I like the roller coaster analogy that uh, he used. It's uh, exactly this. It's, it's there'll be much more violent. That's what I meant by volatility, mm -hmm. and specifically in the non-equity. Everybody, when I said volatility, I always think about equity markets. It, it's going to be in in in, in currencies and in, and in, in bonds and in credit. And and especially in things like high yield credit. So, um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I think it'll be a little bit more managed than than that not may portray it to be. Um, I sent you a chart on inflation saying inflation comes in 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 waves. And I've you know, I've said it's going in three ways, but we've found that the inflation uh, it stays with us and 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 we, and we keep going. It appears we go from inflation to deflation, but the answer is that we have both and they're always working, but they get more emphasis at, at any given time. And lately we've fallen into a deflationary part. It doesn't mean inflation has stopped. It, it may have slowed down in some cases, uh, but they're still, they're still portraying, are still working. So the deflation is with us, but these, but those are the ball, those, those swings, that's, Underneath what drives that is what's really driving this 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 volatility, and and what's what the the core of it is, 
that inflation is getting to be more and more, especially in the United States, where our 70 percent consumer economy inflation is about about um, the things that we absolutely need and we pay cash for because we don't finance them too. Well, we do it indirectly, but we uh, we pay cash for them, whereas deflation is getting to be and is in more and more in what we want. It's longer term and we finance. And the structural changes that are happening with finance and credit are making those particular forcing functions. That is what the needs and the wants in our in our in our consumer base in a 70 percent com- economy more profound. And my hesitation earlier is around the world, because I don't think the rest of the world will have necessarily that same level of of exaggerated response that we may see in the United States because they're not as dependent. I mean, China, they're barely 32% of their economies in inflation or is rather in consumer. Their, their consumer isn't the big deal. It's where the capital is going. Right. Or coming from rather. Um, all right. Well, look, as, as we're getting near the end of our time, Gordon, I do want to get into kind of just your, your get down to brass tacks and, and where you, what, talk about your market outlook so that, that viewers have a sense of what you think is is more likely to happen with some of the major asset classes going forward in the next six months, year, whatever. Um, real quick, though, uh, you know, economists always warn about uh, deflation because they see that as, as people, um, uh, you know, pulling in their spending. Um, and, you uh, you know, you get caught in this deflationary spiral and you have a depression like you, you had you know, back in the Great Depression. Um, but I wonder with inflation, the way in which we're experiencing it right now, um, you know, the, the cost of living is increasing so fast um, and in general more faster than, than wages have been. Um, that in itself is also impacting uh, economic growth, right? Because there's just less left over for consumers to spend to drive economic growth. Um, so uh, I presume, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but but I presume a future of higher inflation, uh, you suspect is, is going to basically be a drag on economic growth going forward. Is that true? Very much so. I mean, is it, we're, we're, uh, we're you eating our seed corn, if you were, to increase increase wages, which have been under underutilized for years. Uh, the, the share of the profits that are going to labor. They have every right to be uh, striking right now. And the fact that we're seeing strikes at the level that we're seeing right now says that we're very much at the beginnings of this inflation driven from from labor. Mm -hmm. Look at the UAW. I mean, when when the UPS settled at $170,000 for a driver, the shock waves went through every union in the country. I can imagine their phones ringing off the hook saying, what are you guys doing over there? Sleeping? So, so the UAW, UAW, UAW Workers, but yeah. Automotive <laughs> Workers, UAW, went out and strike. And their demands are they want a 40% increase. They want a four-day work week paid for five days. And they want all their pensions reinstated. Hello? And they're out. All three are out. Now, they're, they're going to get part of that. But we've got this massive move uh, towards um, towards strikes. And it's pushing up. That's why the, the service sector. Um, are, and having to pass it on. So that that's another in, that has nothing to do with energy. It has nothing which will will spike. It has nothing to do with food, which will spike on food and energy and fertilizer. Um, so so it's coming. And now, but but the big caveat of this is what's going to happen with that labor. You know, we have a whole discussion we could take on on artificial intelligence. Uh, which is it's, it's going to be very, very threatened to the to professional white collar workers as more and more apps unfold and they will come at a rate that you're going to shock yourself. Um, uh, maybe you won't, but that, that, that that's coming. But that's only part of it. You know, and I won't be political here, but I have to make the statement. We got something like six million thereabouts um, patro- pay, uh, immigrants right now coming across the southern border. That's not by coincidence. That is planned. It's perfect. I mean, it's it, we're told there's no problem, but it's structured. And it, it's, it's actually good news, bad news, because they're going to need jobs. They're not going home. We're not, I, I don't know what the politics are. I just know the realities are that they're going to want to work. And they're not going to demand 40% increases. They're going to say, 
don't want new new plants. That, um, I'll work at this rate. Glad to do it. And I don't need to know the language because I'm working on this kind of in this environment. And um, and I think that this is a way that the, the, the Bidenomics is looking out because they know the inflation wave is coming. I mean, they know this is a given, no matter what they want to tell you. And this is another way of what they're trying to plan. And they're and they're looking at the election. I'm always told, well, it's more voters. No, no, no. It may be, but there's, there's another strategy going here. I might, okay, interesting. And, and we don't have time to dive deep into this, but because we are reshore, you know, we, we want to reshore. Um, and we will. So, we will accelerate that. We are going to accelerate that and fund it. It's coming. Okay. Um, but we know that that's the plan. And, and you know, it, I think everybody understands it. You know, we we had these just-in-time global supply chains that we found out were highly efficient, but but not resilient. And we don't want to be caught the way that we were caught during the pandemic. Um, but of course, labor costs a lot more here than it did in places like China. And you're basically saying uh, that, you know, an influx of, of, of cheap workers um, will be one of the ways in which we absorb some of the shock of of reshoring, or we're at least I'm saying there's some thinking going on that way, and there's an attempt um, at, at at that. I believe is part of it. Okay, yeah. Whether it works so we'll out, see. Or not, we'll but see. We'll see. But we'll these see. are these are the kinds of political economic matters that I I, I have to stress with our listeners that you got to pay attention to today. These are just yeah. not all. This is politics. These these are huge strategic moves that are going to impact profits and direction and funding and liquidity coming out of the government because they have they're, they're cornered they're trapped if you were sitting in in a white house uh what are you going to do you're not going to just let it happen i don't think or maybe i take that back i don't know what they're going to do so G gordon when i was in business school um there was a course we were forced to take i can't remember the, the full title but it was basically called non-markets and it was about all these factors that will that can influence what happens in the economy and the markets, but they're not market driven factors. They're, they're things like what you're talking about. And I'll tell you, none of us wanted to take the class. We just thought it was the most boring, extraneous thing that they were forcing us to take. And in retrospect, as I look back, I'm like, oh, my gosh, that was the class we should have paid the most attention to. Because I, I took it. I took it. And it was called forcing functions. I mean, it's absolutely what's happening. <laughs> uh, that's a much better title, forcing functions. Um, all right. Well, look, in the few minutes we have left, um, let's talk about your market outlook from here. So we've got a bunch of viewers watching who have listened to what you've had to say. They're, they're thinking, Gordon's really smart. I'm going to take all this stuff into consideration. I don't want to become collateral damage to what he thinks might be happening ahead here. So what do you see going forward, given the roadmap you've laid out here for stocks, for bonds? Are there any particular assets you you particularly favor right now? Or are there ones you wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole? Um, as I said right at the beginning, um, I think this is the time to take your foot off the equ equity side of the house. There's other ways to make money just then other than the stock market. Uh, there will be a time to come back in. Um, I uh, This is the time where on the surface, you should be buying gold and silver hand over fist. Um, I'm, I, I think that there should be an element of that in your portfolio, but I really caution because you can guarantee that the government will tax the living hell heck out of it. Uh, they will regulate it or they will fix the pricing. It's going to happen as soon as, as God made little green apples at some point. So, you know, if you're going to do it, you better be quick, quick like a bunny at, at, at the right time. But that's typically how you address that. The whole move to uh, to commodities, I think is still in front of us, but it's still out of ways. So that we've we've had the first wave of that, of investing in in commodities across from grains right across the spectrum through through energy. But there's a time and a place because the whole advent of the BRICS 11 has almost cemented that into place where money really is going to shift. It's not about de-dollarization. It's about the real value of money being the either. And I've said this on your show last time, you either build it, you mine it, or you produce it, you don't mm -hmm. print it. And so the, the commodity players are so powerful now that they're going to start dictating what you pay. And that's where the pricing is going to be. So at some point, commodities are going to begin their second big wave, uh, big wave up. So that's what you need to be giving a lot of thought and education and getting good advice on right now. On the shorter term, um, I believe that the investment focus is in the area of bonds. It's in the area of credit and in 
area of high yield risk zombie corporations and on various sides long and short on that and you need advice on how to how to do that uh, from those who um, are uh, can give you that kind of advice um, but that that's where I would be playing on I think that's uh, something in the next six to eight in short to intermediate term and it's safer you know the, the law you don't know, buy one year you can buy a one year T bill right now and pay five percent you can sleep at night and if someone to go a little further, go down, you make capital gains. Uh, you know what do you that and that money is there for when something gets really obvious to you. So I, I would play this is time to be prudent. That's what I'm trying to say. Time to be prudent. Time to be cautious. It's a risk. It's a it's a world in change right now. And who who can forecast? I've given some opinions here. We can't forecast it, but it'll be your ability to to react to it and have the capital and money available. Because I've always found in the last comment, Adam is when it does happen and it's ha it's so obvious that this is the best investment opportunity you've ever had but it's too late because you don't have any money <laughs> and you've lost it on the move and you got in too early or whatever if you had just been patient whether it's too high or too low uh, when it, when it suddenly happens there's no it's laying on the table it was the bottom of 2008 it was like at 666 how much lower can it go it's a relevant time to get in <laughs> The world isn't come, I, and I, I need to apologize to our fans. I, I've been particularly negative here. I didn't mean to be. Um, I'm actually more optimistic about what's in front of us. This is a, a world shifting from a unipolar to a multipolar world. There's some great opportunities. Um, so don't be frightened of it, but but just do your homework. Okay, and it sounds like what you're saying is is you know big period of transition here. And as a result, there's probably going to be some pretty big repricings as we, as we head into the transition. And you want to make sure, first and foremost, that you don't get wiped out so that you can deploy your capital when the dust is, is less dust in the air and things are a little bit more clear into these potentially quite good longer term opportunities for the new era we're heading into. But here in the, in the here and now, just focus on not getting wiped out. We're right on. That's, that's a time to be uh, be prudent and uh, and prepare for it. All right, great. Um, Gordon, this has been fantastic. I could go for another two hours with you. Um, I'm sure everybody is wishing I would do that, but I've got to be respectful of your time. Um, I do want to say you have uh, an open invitation to come back on this channel whenever you want, sir, particularly if some of the things that you've been warning about start to happen. And I'd very much love to have you on when that does happen so that as emotions are getting inflamed or whatnot, you can be telling people, hey, you know, th this is what I've been expecting. This is what I think is going to happen next. You can be the calm voice of reason. And then, of course, when we get to the point where you begin to see some of those obvious opportunities just laying there on the ground, you know, to use your, your analogy from 2009, um, please come back on and share those with our audience. Um, for folks that have really enjoyed this conversation, Gordon, and would like to follow you and your work, where should they go? Yeah, we, I have a site that I, I that distribute my work uh, exclusively. It's called matasi.com. That's M-A-T-A-S-I-I.com. I put out a a weekly newsletter and 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 videos on a regular basis that are issued through that. It's a, a minimal uh, charge for it to cover our our costs, um, and really, it's nothing more than a reflection of our research because we make our money investing and we kind of share it. Because and why why I go into this is that. We look for people to give us feedback. We have found some of the brightest people in the world and in all walks of life can write us an email and the lights go on because we didn't know something. And so that's why we do it, because we want to solicit some bright ideas that make us money. And by the way, thank you for the invitation. And if we've made some money, I'm glad to come back and gloat. Um, <laughs> if I lose some money, I will pro probably won't be hearing from me. For all <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Um, well, look, uh, again, Gordon, you're one of my very favorite people to interview. Thank you for coming on and giving us so much time. Um, folks, two last things before we go. Just a quick reminder that the Wealthy on Fall Conference uh, is still available uh, for you to purchase tickets at uh, at the early bird price discount of almost 30%. To do that, just go to wealthion.com slash conference. And if you're an alumnus of one of our previous conferences, check your email inbox because you should have a code from me 
that'll give you an additional 15% discount on top of that 30% discount that I mentioned. Uh, and if you'd like to see Gordon uh, make good on his promises there and come back uh, and share his uh, his insights with us when he sees important new developments occur, uh, please encourage him to do that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Uh, Gordon, it's again, always a pleasure. Thank you so much, my friend, for coming on. Look forward to having you back on as soon as you're willing to come back on the channel. Thank you very much, Adam. Look, always enjoy these talks. Talk to you later. Thanks. Everyone else, thanks so much for watching.